and shoot raw. Cool. Raw, the mythical format. So superior, so far beyond all the traditional boring video formats. It doesn't matter how bad you screw up as a video shooter, Raw will save your butt. Because it's magic, right? Right? Well, it's a bit more complicated and not quite so magical. Sorry. Ever since I've been working in the film and television industry, I have been watching the development of several RAW cameras and formats. Besides a few tries with Red RAW, I never really got into the RAW workflows, because I always felt that the benefits of shooting RAW don't really make up the hassles that come with it. You need more memory, more computing power and simply more time and effort in the post to do things by hand that modern cameras usually can already do for you while shooting. But for almost two years now, I own the Canon C300 Mark III, which I love using for my television work, but also for my commercial and independent film shoots. And suddenly, I had the opportunity to shoot RAW right at my disposal. And the expenses in terms of bit rates are not even that high with Cinema RAW Lite. It's just marginally above the 50p intraframe codec bitrate. So I thought it was time to have a look into the RAW workflow and how much it will add to the image quality I can produce. According to the white paper of the C300 Mark III, in this flowchart the ISO settings and white balance precede the RAW signal processing. But it's not quite clear if the actual Bayer pixel values are affected before analog digital conversion, or if this information is just stored as metadata, as it should be in a true RAW workflow. Furthermore, there's an optoelectrical transfer function added to the signal before compression, and that's actually a good thing. True RAW encoding traditionally works in a linear fashion. The term is pretty misleading, as light itself does not behave in a linear way. Each f-stop within the latitude of a camera contains twice as much light than the previous darker f-stop. So linear encoding means that each f-stop gets the amount of code values proportional to the amount of light it represents. So if the darkest f-stop in an image gets x amount of code values, the next brighter stop gets the amount of 2 times x, the next brighter f-stop gets 4 times x, and so on. This way, the single brightest f-stop gets more than half of the code value estate, while the darkest f-stop does not even get a single one, not even at 12-bit. This is a very inefficient way of storing image data, and this is why our average photo camera nowadays uses RAW files in 14 or even 16-bit to get acceptable shadow bit depths. The conversion through an OETF before bitrate reduction is like adding a log gamma curve to your RAW data, more evenly distributing the separate f-stops to the code values. Additionally, there's some spatial compression going on, just like in the intraframe codec and we are going to examine if you can see that in the image. So for most of my tests, I disabled the electronic image stabilization for the XIVC format to get the same field of view as the RAW formats. However, I kept the lens compensation functions, the correction of chromatic aberrations, peripheral illumination, which means lens vignetting, and diffraction correction are not available when shooting RAW. For some tests, I used the Sigma 18 to 35 mm art lens, which is not supported anyway, so the lens corrections are not active in every XAVC clip. But I will show some examples where they are. If you saw my comparison of ProRes versus AVC HD, you already know that I have two favorite shooting scenarios to stress test intraframe versus interframe encoded formats. The weakness of intraframe codecs are images with a lot of detail, while interframe codecs struggle when there's a lot of motion in the frame. RAW is intraframe as well, so let's start with an easy one for the intraframe codex. These water reflections are tough for intraframe codex because the motion of the water is erratic and hard to predict for the P and B frames. So when we compare the three 4K DCI clips, each shot in 25P, one in long gob, also known as interframe, one in intraframe and one in RAW, and we put them side by side, then we could say, well, they all look great. So, just use whichever codec you like best and be happy. Case closed. Bye. Or, we have to get pixel peeping really hard here, because the differences are too small to really see them without a magnifying glass. 
You will probably never notice it when you're watching the footage at normal speed on a big television or even at a large cinema screen. So let's zoom in and slow the footage down. I will even raise the contrast so we can examine the artifacts in their full glory. As expected, the Interframe codec, here labeled as Longop, struggles with this type of image content. You can see the usual blockiness, especially in the dark areas. Using C-Log2 as picture profile decreases the artifacts and the shadows a little bit. Comparing the RAW and the Intraframe codec, I don't see much of a difference though. Do you? Moving on to the next test. This is a static image, but with a ton of detail. On the surface, again, each of these codecs look great. But let's zoom in on this dark patch on the right corner of the screen. In this scenario, the long gob codec suddenly looks better than the intraframe codec, which shows really bad artifacting in the shadows. Apparently the iframes in the interframe codec are just very mildly compressed, so the quality can be carried over all the P and B frames in the group. And although this codec has the lowest bitrate with just 160 megabits per second, the details in the shadows are clearer and cleaner than on the 410 megabits per second intraframe codec. Then I set the picture profile on the camera to C-Log2 and suddenly the tables have completely turned. Now the long op codec even looks better than the 12-bit RAW. It is a trick of the MPEG compression to compress the shadow higher than the midtones because the human eye would not perceive the higher compression in dark areas. Log formats set their black level at a higher value, so the compression will not affect it as much. Here we are seeing how well this works. On the surface you might think the intraframe codec is just a tad noisier, but these are in fact spatial compression artifacts. As the intraframe codec has to compress every single image in the sequence on its own, even though the bitrate is more than twice as high compared to the interframe footage, the compression on the individual frames is heavier and it shows. The RAW, however, does only show very mild compression artifacts and a bit more color noise, so it's enough to make the shadows more mushy than on the interframe material. And these small color splotches don't look right to me. My colleague said it's the higher color fidelity of RAW but in my eyes these colors seem a little off and too saturated for a color detail in the branches. So I would rather guess a few of these color nuances come from Moray artifacts. Anyway, that's the 25 frames per second 12-bit 1 gigabyte RAW of the Canon C300 Mark III. As most of my projects for television are shot in 50p, I also wanted to see how the 50p 10-bit RAW compares to the HOLY SHIT! Did anyone claim that RAW is the format with the highest image quality? Because to me, this looks like easily the worst codec choice you can make on this camera. Funny enough, the image quality of XAVC codecs stays the same in 50p because they are basically just doubling their bitrate. 260 megabit per second and 810 megabits per second respectively. But RAW 50p stays the same at just 1 gigabit per second, so consequentially the compression of each frame is higher. But I didn't expect it to look this bad. I did another test at this beautiful railway station to have a deeper look into this. Here I also tried C-Log3 for XAVC and in the RAW development to test out if this would make any difference. Short answer, not really, you will just probably get better results at higher ISOs. During these tests, I kept the camera at its base ISO at 800. For whatever reason, when you develop RAW directly into wide dynamic range gamma, the picture you get is brighter than when you develop it into log and put a conversion LUT on it. I tested several frame rates in RAW again and as you see you just get more and more color noise in the higher frame rates. Still, keep in mind what looks awful here is still a tiny fraction of the whole frame, so the noise will be far less noticeable to the average viewer. And the noise can be cleaned up pretty well in post. RAW however shows further shortcomings. With all these lines and patterns in the frame, you can clearly see strong colored moiré and jagged edges. These moirés and jaggies are not repairable in a feasible manner. So I would prefer the softer but overall cleaner image of the XAVC files any day. I was so surprised by the bad quality of the RAW files that I was thinking I'm doing it wrong or made a mistake during development in Premiere Pro. So I thought I should try the way Canon has intended me to take and I downloaded the original Canon RAW development tool, installed it, 
extrapolated the raw clips into DPX 12-bit, which turned my 1.6GB 30-second Cinema Raw Light file into a 13GB image sequence. What the fuck? On a Mac, you seem to get ProRes 444 as an export option too, but on my Windows machine, I am stuck with these rather painful options. I imported these sequences to Premiere and voila! The image is indeed way better than the Premiere version of the RAW files. The jaggies are gone, the chroma moray is way less and it definitely has a higher resolution than the XAVC version. But still, the details and the shadows still appear clearer to me in the long gob C-Log2 file. And it doesn't change the fact that the 10-bit version of RAW is just utter garbage, sorry to say. So the implementation of the Cinema RAW Lite in Premiere is unfortunately way inferior. Besides that, I really appreciate the fact that the camera can compensate for chromatic aberration of many Canon L lenses, which make a huge difference as you can see here. These functions are not available when shooting RAW. So if you're using a different program like DaVinci Resolve, your results might differ. As I don't use these programs, I would appreciate if you share your findings in the comments. Let's look at the higher color fidelity of the 12-bit RAW. 12-bit has 4 times more color information than 10-bit, so assuming you want to do a really crazy stylized grade with lots of high contrast, this might come in handy. To observe this, let's mistreat the footage really badly by adding a strong contrast curve. The first thing I notice are the different spatial compression artifacts. Depending on your image content, this might concern you more than the bit depth, but let's focus more on the color fidelity now. We should see finer color gradients in the 12-bit footage, but unfortunately they are all drowned by the camera's sensor noise, although the camera is still set at its base ISO at 800. When investigating a single frame, I can definitely see more color variation, but there's also a lot more colored noise, especially green noise. The DPX version shows slightly reduced colored noise compared to the Premiere Pro RAW. In order to make the most out of a high bit depth image, you need a very clean image from the sensor first. There is a highly interesting paper by Emil Martinek about that phenomenon. In this paper he shows a really nice demonstration how you can clearly see banding in a smooth gradient when the bit depths drop from 8-bit to 5-bit. However, if there is a certain amount of noise added to the gradient, you will have a much harder time to distinguish between the low and the high bit depth gradient. I will put the link in the description so you can test and read it yourself. However, you can still dodge some of these issues when you add some noise reduction. This is also an old trick to sort of upsample low bit depth material and still get smooth gradients. Add some artificial grain to that and tell everybody you shot the footage in 16-bit. Next up, high ISOs. The amount of noise is quite the same across all recording formats. Here I shot the XAVC in C-Log3, which should have the least amount of noise in higher ISOs. In RAW, the noise looks more refined and therefore you should be able to clean it up better in post, but actually denoising works very well in the XAVC formats too. Just for fun, I cranked the ISO up to the max. 102,400 ISO. Interestingly, the noise just appears in the dark areas of the picture. The brighter areas are much less affected. Even at this crazy high ISO, I was able to reduce it pretty well in post. However, you might need to work against the reddish color tint caused by the color noise. Here the price should go more to the amazing denoising software than to the Canon codex. Last but not least, I did an overexposure test. One very common argument you hear is that RAW has better highlight retention. Here is my very simple test setup. I just pointed a lamp at a map and created a hotspot. As I didn't want the material to be clipped unintentionally by a lot, I just took the lock footage and added a little bit of contrast. My impression is the colors in the highlights are a bit more saturated in RAW, but other than that, the clipping point of all these three formats is exactly the same. Turning the exposure down in the development tool in Premiere or Canon RAW tool just brings down the white point. There is no more detail hidden in the blown out areas. On the other end, the latitude of a camera is limited by its noise floor. And as the noise levels are generally higher in RAW, it means that the overall latitude is actually lower when you shoot in RAW unless you clean up the noise manually in post. So what's the verdict? If you plan to use frame rates higher than 30p, RAW is probably your worst format choice on this camera. 
In 12-bit, yes, you can get amazing results with RAW, but it takes a lot of effort to get the footage look better than simply shooting in XFAVC. And you're giving up on all the nice benefits modern image processing gives you. Having stabilization for my still lenses and getting rid of chromatic aberrations in camera is such a useful feature to me that all the benefits of RAW pale in comparison. Personally, I simply don't have the time to spend on RAW formats, especially when my post-production is time-consuming enough. I am pretty confident that the long gob codec and C-Log2 will give me the quality that I'm looking for, even if I'm planning extensive post-production. And if one day I want to film in heavy snowfall, for example, you never know, I can easily switch to Intra. That's it. Thanks for watching and see you again.